Now at six, we are moments away from President Donald Trump's first speech to a joint session of Congress, where he is expected to outline his plan for the American people. Good evening. I'm Micah Ullman. And I'm Cher Calvin. Welcome to the KTLA 5 News at 6. Tonight, we will bring you that speech live, as well as expert analysis from our two guests. We are joined by political science professor Peter Matthews and political analyst Matt Klink, who will be weighing in throughout the night. But we begin with KTLA 5's John Finolio, live in our newsroom with a preview of tonight's speech. John, good evening. Chair Micah, good evening to you. The White House says the president will present an optimistic vision. Tonight's theme, renewal of the American spirit. Now, this may be his most important sales pitch yet and a chance to hit the reset button with many Americans uneasy with some of his initiatives during his first 40 days in office. Now, the White House has really some talking points of what we can expect tonight. Health care, tax reform, the economy and immigration all on Mr. Trump's agenda. We're also learning that the president may discuss a major shift on immigration. The president telling reporters earlier today he's open to overhauling the policy that could grant legal status to millions of undocumented immigrants already in the U.S. who have not committed serious crimes. Now, you'll recall that during the campaign, Mr. Trump called for a deportation force. He later distanced himself from those comments only to sound alarm bells all over again with the rollout of his latest immigration and travel ban. Now, in a rare moment of humility, the president acknowledging earlier today that he has some work to do to win over all Americans. I wouldn't do that. I, I think in terms of... Um, effort, which means something, but I give myself an A plus. Okay, effort, but but that's you know results are more important. In terms of messaging, I would give myself a C or a C plus. And we understand the president is arriving soon. Share, Micah. I'll send it back to you. And as we await the arrival of the president and the announcement, typically from the Senate Sergeant at Arms to the Speaker of the House. Uh, that the President of the United States is preparing to enter. We want to bring in our guests, Peter and Matt. The President tonight addressing most certainly a divided House and a divided nation coming into this speech with a 44 percent approval rating, which is decidedly low for such an early point in his presidency. Typically, we see somewhat of a honeymoon phase coming in 44 percent, very low among Democrats, 10 percent. What do you anticipate tonight? Micah, the challenge that Trump faces is that he not only faces a divided country and a divided House, he faces a divided Republican Party. We're already seeing a pushback from the Senate and members of the House on certain aspects of the president's budget. So he is kind of in the firing line from all sides right now, which is kind of, I think, where he's the most comfortable. That's what he had throughout the whole primary and general election season as well. Yeah, well, days leading up to this, of course, the budget um, definitely a hot topic, and we're talking about $54 billion in military spending is one of them and McCain a, a, a staunch critic about that saying it's not enough and some people say it's way too much right. because that's a 10 percent increase and we at this time we spend more money from the United States military budget than the next seven countries put together mm -hmm. and uh, we're wondering about how much that can continue when he's trying to spend money on infrastructure and other spending which needs money and so he can't just take it from thin air or drive up the debt too high mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, controversy about that 54 billion dollar increase how will the president be received Tonight, we all remember in 2009, Representative Joe Wilson screaming, You lie, at then President Obama, uh, as we anticipate the arrival and then the entrance of the president. Now, Matt, do you anticipate a Joe Wilson moment tonight? No, I think that the Democrats were urged are going to be on their best behavior tonight, that they're not going to break the seal like Joe Wilson did and scream something out. My guess is that they'll sit on their hands and be super quiet, and that the Republicans will be the ones that are standing up and down. And we're referring to, of course, uh, when President Obama addressed Congress in 2009, and Republican um, Representative Joe Wilson screamed, You lie, when he was talking about, when uh, President, then President Obama was talking about health care. Um, so we, we anticipate perhaps that the Democrats, as you mentioned, that they'll be a little bit calmer tonight. Um, but there's a lot of contention nonetheless. I mean, he needs to get a broader spectrum of his audience tonight. And this is the first time that we're seeing him since the inauguration address a wider audience in the nation. Uh, do we expect, we have the, the title of, of what uh, they're going for, it, optimism here. Do we, do we see that happening tonight? Well, half the audience are going to be Democrats who are going to be against him. And very silent and also they're going to probably bring they are bringing guests 
uh, who represent his constituencies who were hurt by him, the Muslim Americans, the many Democrats are bringing uh, immigrants, and the address to, uh, the, against the, for the president's response will be coming from a dreamer, an undocumented young person who's here, so he'll be giving the Spanish language address, uh, address to the country in response to the president, too. Indeed, a house divided. Uh, and, and, and when you talk about the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, he, too, is under enormous pressure to notch some legislative victories for Republicans, and he has great challenges ahead. The conventional wisdom is he's got to have something on the president's desk before the end of March. Well, they're on a very, very tight schedule, Micah. They have to get health care reform done so they can move on to tax reform, and the longer they delay health care reform, it pushes that tax reform back, and then you start to run into problems with the economy, which then, if it's messy now, wait until if you're into the summer and they don't have tax reform. Let's talk about the guests uh, that President Trump uh, um, have, have here at, at Congress here on Capitol Hill. Um, we have a local connection, and this is Jamil Shaw uh, Sr. He is the father of Jamil Shaw, who was killed in 2009, uh, 2008 rather, and um, uh, he uh, was killed by an illegal immigrant. Let's talk a little bit about that and how the guests also play a role about who, what Trump will touch on during this speech. He's going to make a big point about uh, deporting the uh, criminal illegal immigrants, the ones who have been accused of a crime. But he's, he may be shifting to allowing some path to not citizenship, but to some form of legalization uh, as well. So he's kind of like waffling on which way he's going to go with the undocumented workers. With Jamil in the audience, though, he's going to portray that many of some of the undocumented people over here have committed crimes. You know, a right? potential pathway for those who haven't committed serious who have crimes. Who have not committed serious caveat. crimes. That's correct. Right. And That's then Mike, yeah, Micah and Cher, he also is going to have the family of a police officer who was slain, mm -hmm. again, by an illegal immigrant. And also he's going to have Antonin Scalia's wife uh, to, to try to, to drum up support for his Supreme Court nominee. The president takes the day as saying today that he will, quote, speak from the heart and talk about things he wants to do. Chief among them, health care reform, greater military spending, and border security. As he hands a copy of his speech to Vice President Mike Pence, another to Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, and President Trump now turns to face Congress and the nation tonight, live from Washington, D.C. I am asking all citizens to embrace this renewal of the American spirit. I am asking all members of Congress to join me in dreaming big and bold and daring things for our country. I am asking everyone watching tonight to seize this moment, believe in yourselves, believe in your future, and believe once more in America. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States. And there you have uh, the first presidential address to the a joint uh, Congress there in Washington by President Trump. Very interesting uh, the tone that he carried. We are joined again by our political science professor Peter Matthews and political analyst Matt Klink as we kind of go through his speech that lasted about an hour and two minutes. Your thoughts on, on, on the tone of his speech tonight first. Much more thematic and positive compared to the inaugural address, obviously. And he made some very substantive points regarding free trade and TPP as a for, uh, opposed to fair trade, keeping jobs here, also education, talking about school vouchers and choices. I would like to point out that school vouchers would be one thing to let people have choice, but it would also take money out of the public school system. So there's some concerns that we have about some of the proposals, but overall the tone was very positive. Yeah, one of the few times uh, on a very short list of universal applause when he talked about the t utter destruction of ISIS. Um, not a surprise to hear that from a president um, with uh, very bold remarks in the months leading up to his election and since as well. Um, and talking as well about planning record spending on defense and infrastructure, uh, yeah. $54 billion. He didn't float that number tonight, but we've heard that uh, it, it run about over the last several days, Matt. Yeah, you know, Micah, he, talk, yeah, he didn't give the number tonight, $54 billion increase in spending on defense, yeah. and he talked about a trillion-dollar infrastructure package uh, by American and higher American, which has got to make both the left and the right smile, and he talked about both public and private funding, so it's not going to be all government money.
Um, you know, I think though in general, I look. I don't think Trump does optimistic very well. It's just not his personality. Uh, but he he hit a lot of marks, and he also found some good jabs. He was very aggressive going after Obamacare tonight, and he really laid down the marker today for the Democrats and for the Republicans about what he expects. I think there were four points that he highlighted. So yeah. very interesting. He highlighted those four points on Obamacare quite well. He also highlighted his guests um, that. Uh, Jamil uh, Shaw Sr., um, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning of the broadcast, who is the father of Jamil Shaw uh, here from Los Angeles, who was shot um, and killed by an immigrant, an illegal immigrant, um, and uh, highlighted that family as well as uh, the wives and the widows, rather, of uh, two uh, police officers that were also killed. Um, but I think that the most emotional moment really came when he uh, pointed to the widow of um, of Owens, who was part of that Yemen raid, uh, the first um, serviceman to die uh, from special forces um, during his presidency. Tell me what your thoughts are, are about that moment, which garnered an applause and of support for um, the widow for over a minute. Yeah, it was very emotional. I mean, you could almost see her come full circle on that. She went from incredibly sad, yeah. and you could see it ripping at her heart. And by the end of it, you could see her almost being uplifted by by unanimous applause from both sides of the aisle. There was there was no one in their seats when when he, when uh, when that applause was going on. I mean, that is a long a minute and a nationally televised address. That is a long time. And to be sure, the applause. Uh could be heard from coast to coast as well, Peter. Certainly, and when you're applauding, uh, you know, a fallen soldier, it's very poignant. Yeah. People feel it from the heart. And the raid itself in Yemen was there were problems with it at times, that, but still, the fact that a soldier died and his wife was there feeling the hurt and pain, and so was the country with her, it was quite uplifting. We are waiting the Democratic response, the official Democratic response from former Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir. Uh, supporters of the Affordable Care Act have often pointed to Kentucky as a model for. Successful implementation of the law. Matt, you mentioned moments ago President Trump taking square aim at Obamacare. If we have that sign, but let's roll it and get your reaction on the other side. All right, apparently we don't have that. They're queuing it up, and if we do have it, we will play it among with a number of, uh, along with a number of other highlights uh, as we see the Senate Sergeant at Arms here, who is the official guide to the president as he leaves the gallery. He is on screen right there. And the president shaking hands with co members of Congress, uh, obviously signing a few mementos, copies of the speech. Uh, as he prepares to leave and we prepare uh, to hear the Democratic response. Matt, um, you, you mentioned that he doesn't do optimism well. His tone seemed a little flat from a neutral observer's perspective uh, in the first few minutes of this speech, and he sort of seemed to find his groove maybe five or ten minutes in where he felt more comfortable, appeared to feel more comfortable. Yeah, I, I don't believe that any American is going to confuse Donald Trump with Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, or Ronald Reagan tonight. But what you did see him do was methodically lay out his program that he wants and also really try to justify what he's done over the last 30 plus days to say, I have been a success. What he didn't talk about, interestingly, he didn't mention the media once, mm -hmm. which has consumed so much airtime over the past month. Right. Um, you know, I think that what's also interesting is if, if we compare the last speech, um, the inaugural address, uh, to this address, the joint session of Congress, um, we saw something very dark. A lot of people found his inauguration speech very dark and, and saying things like American carnage. We didn't hear that. Today we heard, tonight we heard buy American, hire American. We also heard um, America is ready to lead, strong, proud, and free. Your thoughts on that? Well, he went, did mention a few things, such as <clears throat> the uh, millions of Americans that are really out of work. Right. And he mentioned, I know for a fact, that 62% of our workforce is employed. That's a very low workforce participation rate mm -hmm. compared to like three years, several years ago, it was 65%. So that is something he mentioned. He mentioned the 43% poverty rate, uh, 43 million Americans in poverty. So he's still not shrinking from saying that things have to be done. There's a lot to be done still here. Uh, the last eight years has been slow in terms of recovery. Uh, he didn't talk about a carnage. That's the good thing. He didn't mm -hmm. talk about fake news, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He has to keep it an uplifting platform because now he's in charge. He can't keep blaming the past anymore. He's got to take it forward. And I'm interested to see what he talks about when he talks about fair trade instead of free trade. 
What does it mean by it exactly? That Mexico should accept more of our products? How about the fact that Mexican workers are paid so little that they can't even buy our products? So you have to raise the workers' wages in Mexico and other countries to be able to buy our exports. But is that a U.S. problem? not talking about that. That's not a U.S. problem. Well, wait a minute. The U.S. recognized the party that was actually for free trade, not fair trade, when the election took place back in 1988. So the U.S. foreign policy does, in fact, uh, influence which parties come to power sometimes. We should take the right side on that. Let, let's get back to sure. Obamacare and uh, the president uh, putting a bullseye on, on that policy, that, that um, uh, Affordable Care Act uh, policy that implemented by the president. Um, very, very critical of it, uh, mincing no words. Here's the sound. Obamacare is collapsing, and we must act decisively to protect all Americans. Action is not a choice. It is a necessity. All right. Action is not a choice. It's a necessity. And, and he, has to, he has to drive that home. They are on such a rigorous schedule. They have to get Obamacare repealed and replaced before they can move on to tax reform. And he laid down his marker of what he wants, which is continuing to cover pre-existing conditions, which is already in Obamacare. But once you hit that, it deviates pretty radically. He talked about health savings accounts. He talked about block granting Medicare. Um, he talked about... Um, you know, basically using more of the market uh, tort reform. He talked about allowing people to sell insurance across state lines. Those are the meat and potatoes of Republican health care replacement plans that have been swirling around Washington, D.C. for the last seven years that really haven't gotten a lot of attention. They can't even find agreement amongst Republicans. Right. That's right, because Obamacare was a Republican plan originally. We need a single-payer system, much more like the other countries that have half the cost of health care per person than we do, and yet you have them, uh, Obama and, and both Trump tinkering around the edges here while the costs of health care go up in tremendous amounts of money, like as he pointed out. So you're going to have to have a much more efficient way of delivering the health care on a non-profit basis. Our, our neighbor Canada does it very well, actually, but I don't see too many health insurance companies that will support that. Vermont already reject hmm. Vermont rejected it because it was too expensive, and the Colorado voters just defeated single-payer. Anybody who thinks that the government can deliver better coverage at a lower cost is absolutely nuts. We do it in Medicare for the elderly right here. I would disagree. And that's what the we're doing. <laughs> the Medicare we have the, here. There's a very small window uh, of time for them to reach agreement on this. Does it happen? No. I think that it's going to be... I think that I would be surprised if they get Obamacare done, or repeal and replacement of Obamacare within the next month. I think it's probably going to drag out, which means the tax reform will get pushed back until the third or fourth quarter of this year well, at the e earliest. Well, even President Trump was quoted as saying yesterday, who knew that it was so complicated, health care? Yeah. yeah, shocker, right? <laughs> what a shocker. Everyone yeah. else knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, yeah. Welcome to the party, Donald yeah. Welcome yeah. to the party. Something that was interesting that he mentioned um, in his speech was um, something new, and that was voice, the victim of immigration crime engagement, that um, he's ordered the Department of Homeland Security to create an office to serve American victims, and that office is called voice, which is what I just mentioned. You could hear the collective gasp oh, from was. the Democrat yeah. side of the room mm -hmm. when he announced that policy, and I think that it will be very controversial uh, on both sides of the... Uh, there is, half of America is saying absolutely it's the right thing to do, and the other half of America is saying oh my gosh, this is exactly what we don't need. This is not uniting people, this is dividing people. Peter, does it light another fire? Absolutely, yes. And I think it's a very bad situation for Trump in that sense. He's got to unite the people and not divide them with these policies and proposals. The real problem with this immigration is that, once again, undocumented folks don't come here for the weather or for the great food that we have, which we do. They could stay in Mexico on the parts, but they come here for the jobs. And that's because of free trade and NAFTA, as Bill Clinton pushed through with Republicans, bipartisan support for free trade, not fair trade. Not higher wages, not higher environmental standards, which we should have. And Trump should be talking about that. Do you want to take a look at the bite? Let's see, let's see how, how the Democrats reacted yeah. to that moment. And we must support the victims of crime. I have ordered the Department of Homeland Security to create an office to serve American victims. The office is called Voice, Victims of Immigration Crime Engagement. We are providing a voice to those who have been ignored by our media and silenced by special interests. Joining us, 
Yeah, there you hear the jeers. Not cheers, jeers. Lots of them. What was interesting, Micah, is that we heard pre-speech. Here's our Democratic response, now, Matt. We'll oh, interrupt you for and listen to it live. I'm here in Lexington, Kentucky, some 400 miles from Washington. But we've always come together when we remember that we are one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. There, the official Democratic response to the president's speech tonight, former Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir. Interesting choice by the Democratic Party of speaker and of audience there, mm. making a clear play for President Trump's meat and potatoes. That yeah, I was going to say, that was a very Anglo-American room. Uh, there was not a minority. I don't think there was one minority in that background that I saw. A clear play to the, the Rust Belt states that Donald Trump won, by many counts, surprising over them. So... Over Hillary. Okay, I'm sorry. That's all that we have the time for. We want to thank our guests. Thank you, Peter, for being here with us. Matt Clink again, also our analyst here on the KTLA News uh, special edition of the first presidential address to a joint session of Congress. We'll have complete wrap up and analysis tonight on the news at 10 and 11 of the president's address, as well as the rest of the day's news. Along with Cher Calvin, I'm Michael Ullman for all of us here at KTLA. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here tonight at 10.